And now, live from Level 5 Productions on the island of Milleronia, it's The Larry Miller Show! Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and everyone who knows what's really best in Seattle. Hi, folks, and welcome back to The Larry Miller Show. I'm Larry Miller, but in a way, aren't we all? And boy, oh boy, is it a happy day here on the mainland. That's right, we're on the mainland. And the reason is that one of our kids is uh, coming home in a couple of days. For a couple of days. He's uh, rowing in a regatta. He's a crew sculler. And uh, I'm going to go pick him up Friday. It's just great. And he's going to bring a couple more of his crew buddies with them. And then they're going back the same night to where the crew team is. So they can row the next day and compete the next day. And my wife and I are going to be going with them. And... uh who knows? Maybe Colonel Jeff, too. And uh, <laughs> At any rate, though, it's great to be back at Stately Miller Manor. As much as I love Milleronia, and you know I do, and I know I do, and the Colonel knows I do, and the doggies know I do. And uh, boy, it is nice, though. It's a, it's a beautiful day here in Southern California. And as always, that music makes us feel so good course that's the noki edwards orchestra and the linda brown dancers featuring boy tenor brad simpson asking the musical question are there any drive-in movie theaters left and if there are do they still show the snack bar commercial with the performing hot dog terrific question brad and uh, you know first of all yes and yes i uh, i think there are drive-in movie theaters left not as many as I'd like, though. And do they still show the snack bar commercial with the performing hot dog? Yes, but also not as much as I'd like them to. And it was a good question, good topic. I hope so, Brad. And uh, Colonel Jeff was telling me, in fact, there's there's a drive-in on the 10 East. That's the 10 Freeway East, which just goes way the heck out there. In fact, I think that goes into Las Vegas or something, doesn't it? Or you wish it would. At that point, once you're that far east, you might as well gamble. But you know what? Uh, he said there's a drive-in on the 10 East called the Mission Tiki Drive-In. It's a great name. It's, just, it's as silly as can be, which I like. And it has a, a vaguely Polynesian theme to it, he said, in Montclair. And he's been there. The colonel has been there and says it's super fun. And you know what? I... Remember them as a kid? I loved drive-in theaters, and my parents used to take me and my sister to the drive-in on Long Island, the Green Acres Drive-In Theater. And yes, and we loved also, yes, the commercials with the dancing hot dogs. I thought that was great. And I think adults did too. I, I, don't, I don't know why there's anything wrong with being knuckleheaded, you know? Were they a little knuckleheaded? Sure, why not? Who, who cares? Good. Let them be knuckleheaded. Then you can go back to the movie where people are killing each other. But you know what? I loved that. And whew, and the drive-ins are fun and weird and oh, it's great. Well, if you, if you if you bring a date, the two of you can relax and make out for three hours. And I was remembering, and so was he, that those old speakers that hang on the open windows. They they were they were great. You'd roll down the window, and those were still rolling days, so it's not like you had power windows, but whatever you had there, you'd roll them down and hang that speaker in there, and those were metal speakers or metal. They were, you know, steel, as I like to say, There's uh, <laughs> from the fuselage of a B-19. I mean, that's what when those old planes were just sit around, they made them into, for one thing, drive-in theater, theater movie speakers. And uh, when you hung that on the window, by the way, you could actually see the car rock on its shocks. That's how heavy they were. And they were terrific, though. And you, you technically, you couldn't actually understand anything coming from them. 
They were, they were scratching, but that didn't matter. None of that mattered because you were at the drive-in. So could you understand the movie? Who cares? No, you couldn't. And, uh, and Colonel Jeff, in fact, said they actually don't exist anymore. Those speakers don't exist anymore because the new sound system comes out of a certain station on the radio. And I'm sorry to hear that. I, uh, yeah, I know it's a little cranky, but I'd love to see one of those 17 pound things hanging from the big pole next to the, at uh, the car space where you pulled in and you hang it on the window. And I remember, by the way, that, uh, once my friends and I went to the drive-in theater, we were a little older, you know, we had our driver's licenses and, uh, we went to see the Godfather at, at the theater where I grew up. And well, they snuck in that I and one of my friends drove in and our big, you know, secret crime plan was that they would, the other guys, it was four other guys, would climb into the theater over the fence way in the back and they'd climb over the fence and they did and they found us. I don't know how. I don't know how you can ever find someone in a drive-in theater, but they found us and they sat in the car and when they go got in we and they were all in the car hung the uh well the 42 pound speaker on the on the window ledge there and you know what folks and we did also by the way we went to the snack bar and i'll tell you though folks i was telling this to colonel jeff i didn't feel i didn't enjoy it that night i didn't feel good and the truth is it's because we snuck in and four of my friends snuck in. And that's stealing. And no, I didn't think that was right. And so, well, we saw the movie and then drove out. We all drove out together. I didn't say, okay, everyone back over the fence. But uh, you know what? Going to an old movie in an old station wagon was great. I really look back on it fondly. You could dress the kids in their pajamas because eventually they're going to fall asleep in the back anyway if it's a real station wagon. And I'd love to see that again. And yeah, I'd like to go with my wife and make out in the front seat. And uh, Colonel Jeff, you know, well, he can bring her, his girlfriend or maybe the we can go, we can double date into <laughs> out on the 10 East <laughs> in the slightly shady Tiki themed uh, park, and sure enough, we would we would go to the snack bar, and uh, and I'll bet one of us would say as we were standing there, one of us would say, you know, these were never very good anyway, were they? But I don't care. Good question, Brad. Are there drive-in movie theaters left? And if they are, do they still show the snack bar commercial with the performing hot dog? Yes, and yes. And by the way, it's worth mentioning that Noki Edwards just passed away a day ago. And uh, he was the guitarist for The Ventures. And Colonel Jeff was a big fan of his. And uh, Linda Brown passed away just a couple of days ago. And she was from a very famous event in 1950. She was Linda Brown from Brown versus Board of Education. And that was in 1950. And that, well, that changed uh, our, our world and quite a bit. Uh, but it probably didn't change driving movies at that point anyway. But rest in peace to both of them. And by PayPal, still one of the greatest companies in the world. You know what? When you work with PayPal... Sometimes you feel like you're saving the world yourself, and who knows, maybe you are. And they're great for us, and I, uh, I, I'm i very proud to say, you know what, if you like my show, and uh, and why wouldn't you, and you want to help out, and you want to send something that really moves us along and makes us happy, and why wouldn't you, go to PayPal. And what you can do, you can get there a thousand different ways on your computer, your your iPhone, your laptop, anything at all. But you know what? The smartest way to do it is to go to our website. We'll get you there. You go to our website, which is LarryMillerPodcast.com, 
Who's on the Mountain, Tom Mix. Wow, I've got to zip up more. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't even know what that means. But you do that, go to our website, and we have a banner that says PayPal. Click that banner, and you know organizations like that always say things like, well, you know what, uh, join the super luxurious expert category, you know, join the Platinum Club, or... Do this where you get a double value for something. I'm never fond of that. I always say, you know what, just buy us some drinks, okay? There are five levels to it, uh, levels one through five, all the way up to... We're driving to Florida! <laughs> well, that guy still makes me smile. And so, you know what? Go to PayPal and help yourselves and help us. And uh, remember, that's LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. Whew. I've got to eat more salads, maybe. <laughs> I don't know why that's tickling me so much today. <laughs> maybe it's every day. All right. In any case, it's time now for my favorite part of the show, the joke of the week. Well, you know what, folks? Uh, this is a good one. The Colonel and I both got a kick out of it, and I hope you do, too. And as always, if you do, pass it on to family, friends, loved ones, and just uh, here it comes. Two uh, housewives who are best friends decide they're going to have a girls' night out, and they go out, and they're just st strolling along and through their town and out of town, and just they're just having a good time, and they stop here, and they get something to eat, and they stop there. And uh, as they're walking home, they, uh, well, they, uh, they need a restroom. They need to go to the bathroom. And they're walking uh, past the big cemetery in their town. And, uh, they said, look at each other. What are we going to do? Well, we got, you know, when you got to go, you got to go. And they do, they go walk into the cemetery and they tiptoe in, which is silly, really, because who are you going to wake up? But they do, they tiptoe in. And they, uh, well, they both go to the bathroom and realize, wow, we, we don't have any toilet paper. We didn't bring any, any toilet paper. And one of the uh, women says, oh, well, this is, this is ridiculous. And she slips her panties off and uses them uh, to, to, to dry off a bit. And the other one says, well, I'm not going to do that. And she just reaches on to one of the gravestones where there's a wreath that has just been put there a day or two ago. And uh, she uses the wreath. And, uh, well, that's it. They finish and they go home and that's that. And the very next day, their husbands are sitting talking. They went for a drink at a bar after work. And the first friend says, you know, I don't think we can do this thing anymore where our wives just go out together because my wife came home with no panties, okay? And I don't like that at all. And the other one says, you think you got it bad? My wife came home with her panties, but there was a card stuck in them that said, from all of us at the fire station, we'll never forget you. <laughs> That's a pretty good one. We got a, I hope you like it. We got a good chuckle out of that. So once again, if you, if you did too, pass it along. And that brings me to my second favorite part of the show. The Poetry Corner. Yes. I think that was one of the firemen coughing, by the way, and uh, never mind why. But in any case, this is a lovely poem by a great writer and a great poet, Sarah Teasdale. She was born in 1884. She's American and uh, passed away in 1933. She's born in St. Louis. She was very frail and caught diseases easily as a child. Grew up homeschooled and was waited on by a nurse most of her childhood and loved pretty things because of that and fascinated herself with them, and that's what led her to becoming a poet. And she was a great one. And this is called Paris in Spring. 
by Sarah Teasdale. The city's all a shining beneath a fickle sun. A gay young wind's a blowing. The little shower is done, but the raindrops still are clinging and falling one by one. Oh, it's Paris, it's Paris, and springtime has begun. I know the bois is twinkling in a sort of hazy sheen, and down the champs the gray old arch stands cold and still between. But the walk is flecked with sunlight where the great acacias lean. Oh, it's Paris, it's Paris, and the leaves are growing green. The sun's gone in, the sparkle's dead, there falls a dash of rain. But who would care when such an air comes blowing up the Seine? And still Ninette sits sewing beside her window pane when it's Paris, it's Paris, and springtime's come again. Isn't that lovely? And by the way, that's also interests me because it's from a time that was, well, about the turn of the century, roughly, or 1900, 1910, when Wow, I guess everyone was still thinking, wow, Paris, let's go to Paris. We've got to get to Paris. And I don't know if you and I would have been there, but, or how we would have gotten there, but, or if it would have interested us, you know, that the way she writes about it, boy, it sounds great. It sounds like, well, Paris, it's Paris in spring. Wow. You know, and, uh, whew, and th- th- I don't even know quite what that means, except it must, it must have been, one of the most romantic places in the world. I I got my parents a trip to Paris when uh, I was, uh, that was right, it was American Airlines. I had all these miles. I had a billion miles on the on uh, the client mileage program. And I got them a trip to Paris. And uh, on the uh, on the, uh, the great jet, what was that jet called? The jet liner that uh, does, they don't even fly anymore. The, uh, Yes, the Concorde. Thank you, Colonel. And boy, that was great. They flew. There were stars on it. Miles Davis was on that plane with, uh, and my my dad, you know, smiled and nodded at him. And uh, I don't know if Davis was a big smile and nod guy, but my dad sure was. In any case, that's a good way to look at Paris by Sarah Teasdale. Thank you, Sarah. And I hope it's still fun for you, too. And that brings me to my third favorite part of the show. The Magic Movie Moment. Boy, this is a good one. The Colonel and I agree. This was one to think of and one to remember and one to pick. And, uh, oh, it's just terrific. It's called Soylent Green from 1973, directed by Richard Fleischer, starring Charlton Heston, Edward G. Robinson, Chuck Connors, Lee Taylor Young, and so many others. It's a great movie, and it was it had that future shock feeling to it. And, oh, folks, and in fact, was Edward G. Robinson's last film. He passed on after that. And there's some irony to that, given the part he played. But, folks, it's a great movie. Very well directed and very well acted and very well written. And in the movie, it's uh, fairly well well known. I don't want to give anything away. But uh, Edward G. Robinson's character, Saul Roth, uh, was a great intellectual, a great friend of Charlton Heston in the movie. Charlton Heston's character was Thorne. And uh, they lived together, in fact, and Edward G. Robinson says, that's it, I've had it with the way society has gone. It's they, were, they live in New York City, but there are 40 million people living in New York City at that point. And, well, Edward G. Robinson decides to take up one of the opportunities to, well, to have an assisted suicide at... The Soylent Corporation, which oh, manufactures, uh, uh, in addition to many other things, the great food that's the nutrition for the whole country, the whole city, the whole world, really. 
And uh, that's called, they used to have red, they used to have yellow. And this one is the best one, the green, the Soylent Green. And uh, Edward G. Robinson goes in. It's perhaps the best scene in the movie of how this happens. He lays himself down and they have a whole way you can clean up, wash up and and put on a robe and you lay yourself down on this, uh, well, comfortable table or inside. I can't remember whether it's inside the coffin already. I think it's just on a t- very comfortable table. But then music plays and he gets to watch and they have shots and films and images of the way the world used to be at that point. And you see, well, a safari in Africa and there were no such things anymore. And you see, well, rivers flowing and uh, people on a picnic with their families and things that just weren't happening anymore and just couldn't happen anymore with the way the world was going. And Charlton Heston finds out he's looking for his friend. Well, Saul, uh, the Edward G. Robinson character, and he finds out this is what he's doing, that he picked to cho- He chose that he was going to kill himself in this way that you could do it with the corporation there. And, uh, and Heston, well, goes nuts, runs out of his apartment building to get there and save his friend. But he can't. It's too late. The friend is about to pass away, and the friend whispers things to him, the secrets he's discovered. And, well, that big, powerful end of that movie when Heston himself is wounded, and they're taking him off to the hospital, and he's screaming, Soylent Green is people! And that's what Robinson had discovered. And he's screaming it again as a, a to try and bring people together and rally them. It's not a good corporation. They would take all the dead bodies and mash them up and make Soylent green. And that's how they were feeding people. It's, it's a wonderful movie, folks. It's really well done. And some of the greatest actors that, uh, well, Hollywood has ever produced, making a great story. And uh, you know what? What is what would, what would be best in that era? Lee Taylor Young plays, well, uh, a woman that, that Charlton Heston's character, they fall in love with each other. And, uh, well, how does that happen? Do you still fall in love in those days? And uh, it reminded me of, uh, well... A city that I always thought was one of the greatest cities in the world, terrific city to entertain, to work as a comedian. I've worked there as an actor, oh, many times, and uh, that's Seattle, Seattle, Washington. And uh, the truth is, I was telling Colonel Jeff that when comedians, when guys, when fellows would uh, come back from certain cities, they all had a favorite city. All my friends and I, oh, I love that city. Now, what that meant was... Sure, it's a terrific nightclub. Sure, it's a nice place to be. Sure, you can see great movies. And sure, there's great sports there. But what they really meant was, it's a good place to meet reasonable women. And that's, well, that's the best way to put that. And so when a comedian would say, hey, wow, Dallas is uh, is a great city. What he meant was, Dallas is a great city to, well, meet some great women, for brief periods of time. And Seattle, well, I thought Seattle was a great city. And you know what? There are cities, I remember my friend Mike Kane, who's passed on since, there was a a club in Anchorage up in Alaska, and it was a strip club. And they decided to become a comedy club, too. And strippers and comedians have always gotten along just fine. And I don't mean a joke by that. I mean that it's, to, you know, two ways to make a living. And that we were all fine. They had, uh, well, a, a locker room there. And they were they would get dressed and undressed in the locker room. But they didn't care. And we didn't care. And sure, eventually I had to say, would you get out now? But it was it was a terrific place to be. And the two worked out well. 
comedy at around 8 o'clock at night. They'd put a little stage, just kind of an apple box, about four feet by four feet and uh, about a foot high with a mic stand on it and a t- you know, a little about a, f- a three-foot wide blue curtain behind you and you'd have a show. And the shows were terrific. So the, the, the young uh, pretty girls would stop dancing and they would sweep up a lot of the glitter that had been thrown at them. And it was always so interesting to me because there were older couples who would come to see the comedy show. So they'd be in their 50s and 70s and 90s, and they'd be sitting there. So they'd get there about, well, 20 minutes to showtime. So they'd see the last 20 minutes of the strip show, which is fine. Nobody got annoyed by that, and they'd sit there. But it wasn't didn't look like your typical crowd at a comedy club. In any case, my friend Mike Kane became friends, started seeing, um, well, a very nice young woman and beautiful there. And uh, she was the uh, Alaskan women's bodybuilding champion. She and Mike, well, spent some time together, spent that week he was up there together. And a great story that they were, well, in bed together and they had just finished and they were still, well, locked together and just chatting and laughing. And uh, she said to him, she she wrapped her legs around his legs and said to him, you know, from this position, I could break both your legs. And he said, I wish you would just so I could tell people how it happened. <laughs> Which I think is well, a great moment in a young man and a young woman's life. And... uh and I met someone that I liked very much, by the way, that, uh, and we, uh, we, uh, dated for a, a few days there too. And, uh, she was, uh, not the uh, Alaskan women's bodybuilding champion, but she sure was to me. And I, I, I liked her. And after, well, a few days together, we spent the time and would go back to the, well, the uh, apartment the, that the club had for me and, uh, some of the fellows who worked there, not at the same time, but uh, we enjoyed being together. And then she told me, I remember after that, uh, that she sort of left the last night uh, we were going to be together, which led up to the shows on the weekend, that uh, she said, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, uh, uh, my boyfriend at the club, I, and I didn't know she had a boy, you have a boyfriend at the club? And, well, you know, I, I kind of wish you had told me. And she said, well... I'm telling you now, and he's there. He's the manager of the club. And uh, don't tell him about us being together. He's uh, very tough, and he's always armed, and he's a big he's a big drug dealer. And uh, this is the kind of thing, by the way, this is another conversation you can have in bed, but it's not the same as, as Mike's. This is a conversation that usually starts with you going, wait, what? And there are five shows coming up more on the, on the, on the bill of fare. And I, well, I started just, oh, come on. I, I got scared because there are some tough people up there. I mean, they're still descended from, well, the rough, tough guys who settled Alaska. And that was only a half hour before you met them. And, uh, well, I, I didn't say anything to him, and I tiptoed around that club for the next couple of days, and he didn't say anything to me because she and I were the only ones who'd know. And uh, so he didn't come over and say, uh, yeah, do me a favor. After you get off stage, come back to the office. I want to talk to you for a second. Wow. did the Is, is the office at the edge of a cliff? There was a... Uh, the. My blue ribbon, so to speak, was uh, I had a girlfriend I just met in Los Angeles, and uh, I was going up to Seattle, which is a great city, <laughs> and still is, but not that way. And I had a girlfriend I just met. I'd been going out with uh, just a few weeks in Los Angeles, and I decided, you know, that as a guy, as an official man, and who had the handbook and everything, I decided that... I was not going to try to 
meet anyone in Seattle. I was not going to try to look in th- through the audience or see people, see women coming in or out or spotting someone in the audience and forgetting your place in your act. And I wasn't going to do that because I thought, well, I have a girlfriend now for a few weeks and I, if I want to see what, I, what we can make out of that, maybe I should avoid other women. And uh, that's a good idea, I thought. I don't know if it is, but I thought it at the time. And uh, sure enough, in Seattle, there was uh, a young woman who was very lovely, very pretty. She was about, oh, 23 or so. And uh, she came up to me after the show. And uh, the show was uh, down in the, uh, uh, well, the basement of the club, of the big club. And up above was the bar area and the restaurant area. And she came up to me. Which she was very pretty and just lovely. She was wearing jeans and a Brooks Brothers shirt and uh, some topsiders. And she came up to me and said something very nice. She said, uh, you know what? And she complimented me. That was very funny, very nice. And she said, uh, what are you doing now? Why don't uh, you and I go out to a different place and just, uh, well, who knows, maybe get a drink there or just walk around or or uh, show me, I'm sure they have an apartment here for you. And I said, I smiled. I was really touched. And I said, uh, that's really nice. It means a lot. But I just got a new girlfriend in Los Angeles. And the truth is, I'm, you know what, I'd like to stay, well, faithful to her. And even though it's just been a few weeks, so thank you. But I don't think we can do that. And she said, okay. And she smiled. And okay. And I went back downstairs to just to get my jacket in the office of the club, which is just in back of the showroom. And I walked in there, and there's no one there, no one in the office, no one in the showroom, and the whole place is empty. And I walked in there, and then I just uh, turned around. I you know, heard something, and she was at the door, the young woman I had just spoken to. And uh, I said, oh, hi, what's... Uh, What's going on? Well, it's uh, nice to see you again. And I'm just getting my jacket and getting ready to head out. And she just, well, dove right in. She said, uh, so let me ask you something. You just met a a young woman, a young girl. You have a girlfriend now. And so this is it. You're going to stay just with her. And I said, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you're, you're really lovely. And I, I like being with you, but I, I think maybe that's, the way to go and and not, well, not be with you. And she said, she nodded and smiled. And folks, she walked into the office and remember, there's no one there, no one in the whole club. And she walked past me into the office up to the owner's desk. And well, she's, uh, she unbuttoned her Levi's and dropped them. And that was, I guess she wanted to prove she wasn't wearing underwear. And she wasn't. And she turned around with just her head and looked me right in the eye with a very lovely but very serious look. And, well, (laughs) I don't mind telling you. I mean, I'm not embarrassed to say, well, I believe my new program can wait a week. I think this is, I don't know how you can be uh, alive and not, you know, I think even God would say at that point, look, I mean, I'm going to foul you for it. I'm going to punish you, but not the big one. So she was there, hands on the corner of the desk, just as uh, naked as a jaybird, and put her hands on that corner and leaned over it and looked me right in the face and that was that <laughs> i mean i uh i say again even um and i was i wasn't married to say the least i've been faithful to my wife but i mean uh at that point i thought absolutely and uh so you know what you never know how things are gonna go you never know will know what to expect in different cities but i'm glad to be able to say so tell you that story and that you and I know the same things anyway, that Homer is Homer and Pluto is a planet. So remember, folks, as always, 
If you walked out of bed today and had a job to go to and a home to come back to and someone there who cares about you, folks, the game's over and you've won. Never mind, Seattle. Stay with who loves you. We'll see you next time.